our next speaker, Dr. Montero. There are so many people on the call today. I didn't see you pop on Dr. Montero, but I'm glad you're able to be here. She is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine, and she's worked as a clinical psychologist since 2007 there. She is a true expert in health psychology and also has a special interest in patients with digestive and liver diseases. Um, also wanted to mention she serves on our medical advisory board and she was really instrumental in helping us as an organization set up our virtual support groups and providing some initial training to me as we got those up and running. So we are so grateful for her support throughout the years and excited she could be with us today. She has a busy clinical schedule today. So she is squeezing us in probably over her lunch hour. So thank oh. you, Dr. Montero. We will pass it over to you now. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am just thrilled to be part of this and to hear the conversation. Um, you all are experts. I was going to kind of be begin with a nod to that. Um, by the way, on just technical fronts, I don't know how formal this is. I have no conflicts of interest to declare, and I've been privileged to be a part of things with the AIH for, AIHA for many years. And I, I think this is just tremendous, Erin, what you and Dr. Lambert and the whole team have put together here. Um, research supports that your support for one another goes extremely far in helping um, make a major impact in buffering the stress of um, autoimmune disorders and regular life things, which of course continue in the background while you are coping with um, major medical challenges. So, um, so what you're doing is fantastic and privileged to be a part of things. So I, I've, uh, as I was pulling my presentation together in the last uh, few weeks, I, I thought I could uh, <laughs> provide, I'd be honored to provide an even longer uh, talk because this is such a wide um, area of focus and I, I think um, so important. So I'm just thrilled that, that this has a slot in your, in your time today. So I'll try to be brief. Um, my, the ask was to cover um, coping with rare disease and of course, autoimmune hepatitis. Um, again, I would just offer some re perspectives from both my, my years in practice and um, my honor to come alongside people like yourselves who have um, been at difficult intersections in their lives medically and, and psychologically. Um, this is offered in the context of awareness of you all as experts. So uh, I think of it that way each time I meet patients and their, their support teams who come in. So please, please be aware that I, I feel privileged to come alongside you with your own knowledge and expertise. So let me um, share my screen here. This is always the moment at which um, providers feel most at risk, right? They're going to do something not smart. Oh, good. Oh, I think I've got it up. Is that uh, visible to everybody? Yep. Okay, yes. awesome. Um, I don't want to um, overly emphasize things that might, might be boring or not of interest to you all. So I'm going to try to just move quickly, but I would welcome any thoughts, if you want to just jump in, I'd welcome anybody's statements at any time. I appreciated the part I, I'm coming uh, straight from patient time today, so I wasn't able to join much before my uh, time today, but I heard you all referencing fatigue, and I saw from the poll that that's exactly congruent with the literature. Like Fatigue is overwhelmingly like the whopping number one challenge, isn't it? That's... I'm imagining that's uh, that sounds like what you all are endorsing today, and that's certainly what people express. Um, my understanding is that it's not just fatigue. Like people might say, "Oh, I didn't get a good night's sleep last night," or or even I have a new baby. It's profound fatigue. Profound is the best word I can find to describe that. It's like debilitating. Uh, pulling yourself along by your fingernails kind of uh, fatigue. So anyway, with that context in mind, let me kind of set the stage here to say um, that hopefully I am, oh, there we go, able to move. Okay, so just for background, um, rare disease is quite rare, affecting all the uh, rare as one in 10 in the US, which is pretty high for what I thought uh, rare disease would impact. There are almost 7,000 diseases classified as rare. So if you do the math, there are unfortunately few resources 
Um, and in fact, 90% have no FDA approved treatment according to the NIH. So that's that was startling to me as I pulled this together for our time today. Um, it, the psychological implications of that to me are that, that there is greater risk for emotional distress when people may be even less aware than the average bear of what you're experiencing. It might um, increase the likelihood of feeling isolated or even having stigma with limited social support. People might not be aware of or understand um, what is entailed with your experience. That's what I heard you all echoing today. Uh, um, and for all their probably good intentions, um, people, people may make missteps in what they say in their efforts to be supportive. So um, significant distress, as I know you all know, is associated specifically with autoimmune hepatitis, especially with regard to fatigue, quality of life. Dr. Lammer and his team have begun some excellent research on that. I know Aaron mentioned to you that anxiety and depression are more prevalent among people with autoimmune hepatitis. Did you know it was four times as likely uh, and for anxiety and five times as likely to have clinically significant symptoms of depression and anxiety or anxiety and depression respectively. So regardless of how well controlled your disease is medically, it is still normal to experience, normative to experience anxiety and depression. So if you are feeling those things, I'm so sorry for the experience. Please know you are in good company uh, and, and there are things that we can do to help um, stack the deck as I like to say. So try to help improve your experience and increase the odds in your favor. I would think of wellness in the context of um, kind of a, a broader lens of looking at the human experience. The WHO defines this as kind of a, as a state of <clears throat> well-being with multiple dimensions, not just without disease, excuse me. <clears throat> in other words, not just trying to correct for the negative, but above and beyond that, um, a positive experience and multiple di dimensions, uh, including internally, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and then in terms of functioning with work, socialization, et cetera. We also would kind of define the context as not just in these domains of functioning, but also in the larger lens of your context. Um, so in, in the burnout, I have a um, special interest in, in burnout for high, high um, stress professions. And there's a fabulous phrase in that literature that says, beware the con of individual resilience, meaning don't think you have to go it alone that the onus is not on you by yourself to feel better. So all of this is understood that, um, yes, there are things that we can do to help improve our experience, but that's viewed in the larger context of knowing that you are and should be supported by your immediate social support system and the larger communities, medical, um, social, and just our, our, our human, humankind community. So we understand there are lots of dimensions to that and they're, they're variable for people, how much they feel support from those. So um, to just kind of highlight a couple points from the literature, um, the, the most recent study on quality of life from Dr. Lambert and his team, I'm sure you all are pleased to know like national leaders uh, of uh, thought and research are here at our, our center. I'm always honored to work alongside colleagues like that. Um, Dr. Lambert's team took a look at quality of life and identified, as I'm sure is no surprise to you all, that autoimmune hepatitis has a negative impact on quality of life, especially along domains of work, relationships, socialization, what you do in your free time, and health stewardship, how you manage um, what you eat and what your body does. And even with good medical management, and disease, good disease control, there can still be a significant toll that autoimmune hepatitis can take on people. And this unfortunately is uh, correlated with disease duration. So this is um, a risk uh, irrespective of people. By the way, Erin, I'm seeing that some folks are in the waiting room. I'm not sure if that's on me to admit since I'm speaking. No, but... we're gonna take care oh. of that. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right. Um, 
One last quick model. Um, my, my colleagues always laugh when I bring this uh, forward, but I, I think this is so relevant. So um, I know this is a lot of diagrams, but you guys have probably heard the term biopsychosocial model. That's a mouthful, but it's intended to describe, I think, the, the best model that we have to kind of identify the um, human experience in a couple of buckets. Um, medical or what's happening to you physically, psychological, what's happening mentally and emotionally for you, so thoughts and feelings, and then social I always break down into inner and outer dimensions. So outer obviously would be like relationships, work, stress, what's going on in your environment, but also your own internal response to that. So what's your behavior? What are you doing? What's happening around you? What's happening for you medically and what's happening for you psychologically? So we can use those domains as ways to kind of break down both what's, what's happening in terms of risk factors and places where people are experiencing distress, but also avenues for change. So where, where there's a way out, there's a way in. If we've got uh, distress, we also have um, an opportunity for um, targeting that in, in support or with uh, psychological care. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So with quality of life um, challenges, um, autoimmune hepatitis symptoms can kind of be categorized in terms of um, this is at least one, one lens through which to look at this central, um, specifically fatigue, depression, anxiety, and sleep. So things that are centrally mediated through our brains or peripheral elsewhere in the body with joint pain, abdominal pain, and itching, some examples. Um, I was uh, impacted by reading the literature on this. There are some fantastic quotes, including in, in the most recent research uh, with Dr. Lambert et al, where um, patients described their experience in very vivid terms. One uh, quote I was really struck by was the statement that fatigue controls my life, the feeling that this is so predominant, it affects everything I do or the decisions I make about how I spend my time, how I have to regulate the rest of it. Um, people described additionally having significant worry about their health, especially having that worry increase before they had to have interaction with the healthcare team, such as having labs drawn, uh, probably more about the results of the labs than about the interactions with the providers, although that certainly is a source of stress for a number of people as well. People reported challenges with ADL stands for activities of daily living, so people's functioning and then what, what I describe as circular symptom exacerbation. So back to that model, we would describe air, kind of two-way arrows between each of the categories where some uh, of the factors can cause kind of a cascade among the others. So for example, if you have um, pain or poor sleep, that's of course gonna make you feel more poorly during the day, which is likely to decrease what I call your shock absorbers for managing stress or buffering against stress during the day, which is likely to have an impact on your relationships and, and your emotional well-being, which in turn then is likely to decrease your um, ability to engage in restful sleep, which then you can see where this kind of creates a, a circular pattern. So this is, again, normative stuff, but it's, I think, helpful to outline more specifically so we know what we're trying to target in, in treatment. Uh, again, an avenue out is an avenue in, an opportunity for helping things improve. So some of the specific components of the, um, the risk factors include implications from the, the factors I mentioned before. So challenges with um, people around you understanding what you're going through. I, I heard several people on the panel mention this specifically. People around them may not be aware or make you know, statements that may feel offensive or just insensitive to what they're experiencing. They may not realize what your symptoms are, or why you need to manage things in the way that you do, which can often lead people to feel not just isolated, but almost like their illness is invisible. Um, there's a whole um, kind of uh, sub subsector of medical um, experience in the autoimmune category particularly that is described as invisible illness. Pain is also in that category where the experience that you have on the inside may not be readily 
visible to people on the outside or doesn't carry markers um, that people often identify with someone going through a medical challenge. Like for example, cancer, people expect to see outward signs like um, changes in, in um, your face or your coloring, uh, hair loss, um, those visible signs of having illness aren't necessarily the case for autoimmune disorders. And so with that, uh, people may not be as aware of what you're experiencing. And I think there's a, 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 a sensitive balance between how uh, people are often striving to function, but then reciprocally what that means for their um, visibility of their symptoms and therefore um, these aren't always directly correlated, but their, their access to social support. In other words, if they aren't, if they're functioning, people might think they're feeling well, and that may not be at all your experience on the inside. Um, and sometimes people go, you know, based on what they see. And so they, they may presume things are in a different place than they may be internally. And people cope with this sometimes by minimizing their experience. They don't express as much about what they're feeling. Uh, they may um, defer their own needs and not bring them as overtly. Uh, that also, by the way, takes a lot of energy to express, identify in the first place and then express your needs, try to get them met. So that's, that's often a, a multi-layered experience there. They may manage them more privately or have emotional reactions that can include guilt and anxiety. So it's a pretty complicated arena that we, we wanna be aware of sensitively. This, by the way, and the literature is, I think, very accurately described as um, exacerbated by the pandemic and worry about immunocompromised. That's a whole other layer to be thinking about when you go out. I heard one of the panelists describe concern about going to the gym. I hear that from patients a lot, the feeling like I may not be safe. And in a way that's very like viscerally different than um, my patients who may have generalized anxiety and don't wanna go out because they're, they're worried in general, which is valid. But on top of that, those of you who are experiencing autoimmune disorder have a whole other layer of reality to be thinking about. So we wanna be sensitively aware of that. Healthcare provider interactions are another arena that's like replete with challenge for people who have um, autoimmune disorder and particularly autoimmune hepatitis. Um, Literature shows that there's um, a variety of experiences. Some people describe feeling they have excellent care and their providers are sensitively attuned to them and know what to ask and listen to their, genuinely listen to their answers about how they're doing. Other people report very different experiences, unfortunately, including not feeling believed. They even describe feeling abandoned or having, um, which all this makes me gasp, but feeling um, lack of expertise and even stigma from their providers. They may get conflicting information, like one doctor says to do one thing, one doctor says another, and often patients feel in the middle or like they're kind of lost um, without clear direction on where to go. So, and this of course is further exacerbated by that sense of invisible illness. If it takes extra energy to lobby for yourself and present your needs, and even more so with the people who are supposed to be there to help with your needs, that can be a pretty taxing experience. So I would reference again, the idea that you have, um, you know, kind of your own resources for support, but that should be understood in the context of your immediate support system, as well as the larger intention of the healthcare provider community. So that, that you're not intended to go this alone, but I understand it, it may not feel as supportive as it is intended to be all the time. Uh, I wanna be sensitive to the time, so I'm gonna go through this quickly, but this is um, this particular section is referenced from uh, Jones et al. Um, Dr. Lambert is part of that team that um, just um, a couple months ago published, e-published for the, um, the study on quality of life. So they break it down beautifully among uh, symptom-based um, difficulties, and then uh, healthcare provider difficulties, et cetera, what their recommendations are. So you guys have been discussing a lot of this already. Um, I'm going to just quickly highlight what they're saying since you can read about that, but also if we have a few minutes remaining, um, touch on things that I um, would build on these recommendations to share with my patients and do myself as well. Um, so uh, for uh, fatigue and sleep challenges, sleep hygiene is, um, 
kind of an area of um, psychological instruction. We know a few things to help enhance sleep that are quick and easy to share. Just briefly, we recommend, if, if you think of activity and rest as reciprocal curves, you wanna front load your um, activity and energy as much as possible in the day, as well as your stress encounters so that you have arousal and energy output built in up front, and then could have a kind of reciprocal curve downward towards sleep and rest. Uh, with chronic illness, there may not feel like there's much of a, a, a bump or difference between those two, but ideally we would try to get um, activity and output a little bit higher to get rest reciprocally a little bit lower. So if you can even I tell my patients even 10 minutes of gentle walking, if you can manage that, that's enough to get your brain moving and help accelerate those curves upward and then uh, uh, proportionately downward at night to rest. You want to keep your sleep environment cool and dark and avoid, uh, probably most people know, avoiding um, screens and blue light to help your brain not be stimulated. It interprets it like sunlight, which is a cue to be awake and alert. Um, and lastly, you wanna um, try to groom sleep with um, predictable behavior in the same order of operations as much as you can control it towards sleep so that sleep becomes like the next, next natural step that your brain is expecting. Um, so that those, um, may sound like overgeneralized things. And of course we work with people individually on these, but that's an example of how we, a uh, few steps in sleep hygiene that we would coach people on. For emotional distress, psychological care is available. And I've included some resources at the end for uh, reaching out if in your communities, that's not as readily accessible as it is fortunately here at IU Health. Um, there is good data to support that that's efficacious to help people. And there are also great resources available with virtual care that make it um, available without having to come in person. Uh, and there are also good self-help resources online. And besides uh, people like myself are intending to help professionally, uh, peer support is invaluable. So what you are offering to each other and your experience and, and sharing your common denominators here as in this conference, uh, the research supports this is fantastic to help people feel less alone and seen in their experience. So I very much support that. These are, are pretty straightforward recommendations in, in the literature. So I'll just I'll let you kind of um, uh, see the overview here independently. Um, for activity and um, social challenges, um, I would mention specifically pacing is a principle that we, we work on in cognitive behavioral therapy. Pacing is the idea of kind of trying to help gauge yourself relative to your energy and your resources, what you can do. And of course, prioritizing more important events, recognizing um, we all have limits to our energy, regardless of uh, whether we're dealing with multiple medical conditions or some people um, having none. Um, and, and with that, how we budget our energy and use that and then intentionally try to replenish our, our resources um, is the idea of pacing. So that's something that we would overtly focus on. And this may sound all logical, but when you get in the midst of your emotional experience, um, which is again, very human and, and normative with um, medical challenge, including autoimmune hepatitis, it becomes a lot more complex. Our brains don't process the emotional parts and the logical parts as well when they're happening to us directly. And that's, that's true for me as a provider, um, for Dr. Lambert, for any, anybody here on the call today, it's just part of how our brains are wired. So with the, these valuable recommendations, let me just quickly touch on some things that I also um, utilize for patients um, and for myself. So um, with um, proactive communication with your healthcare provider, um, I would emphasize social support is incredibly effective at being not just uh, helpful for mental health, but also for your immune system concretely. In fact, um, there are a number of studies across almost every aspect of medical um, experience that uh, shows social support buffering 
um, medical distress and being protective for longevity. In other words, you can live longer, have healthier immune functioning and have less impact from disease if you are engaging in active relationship with others. There's particular benefit if you are giving to others. So if there is a way that you can be um, engaged in some form of kind of um, interchange, offering your resources that may be, um, for example, through this uh, group online, having connections with others where you can share your experience. That is a form of offering your resources. Um, often um, connecting with people um, via uh, virtual uh, experience. If it feels risky to be in person, especially during the pandemic, um, FaceTime or um, connecting through Facebook, all of those resources can offer at least some aspects of um, social support and the very important immune system protection that can come from that. Um, oh, by the way, when, and I know we're low on time, but quickly during the pandemic, this was highlighted, I thought beautifully by an MIT study that compared social connection to starvation. In other words, people going without social connection was as important as going without food. It was that vital. And I thought that was just beautifully illustrated with that analogy. Um, remember that your um, experience is processed through your brain. And with that, we have an aspect of control. We can shift our focus to shift our experience. Uh, these are called golden traits of what uh, helps, we know helps across different types of medical experience to improve not just well being, but actual medical outcome. When people focus on aspects that are within their control, uh, they expect and uh, observe parts of their coping that are helping them. They trust in their own ability to navigate crisis. Again, it, it kind of focusing on the positives of what they are doing. Uh, it include in their focus aspects that are connected to purpose and connected to social support and allow themselves room to express distress when that's there. Conversely, when people have um, these factors here, they do not, um, these are correlated with less robust health outcomes. In other words, how you cope mentally and behaviorally has a real impact on your medical health as well. So I, I wanna be respectful of the time and not go on. I could uh, give a whole weekend seminar on this and I would be honored to have more time sometime, but uh, where you can connect with um, social support and purpose and meaning that can make a concrete difference. You can do that in lots of ways that are uh, cognitive as well as behavioral. For example, even 10 minutes of exercise or protecting your sleep um, can make a significant impact on, on your immune functioning. So with that, I want to, uh, Aaron, be, be respectful. I'm glad to continue, but I uh, don't, don't want to trespass on anybody else's time today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Montero. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today and, and all really important information that I think in, in embarrassingly so as clinicians uh, in the liver clinic, we, we often forget about these aspects as well. Uh, just to maybe start a discussion just for a few minutes, if you have time uh, as we lead into our break. Um, you know, one thing that's always shocking to me is what patients tell me about other providers. And again, we, we hit on that just briefly. Um, I hear this often as uh, my provider doesn't listen to me or my provider doesn't believe me. Um, you, you, I'm sure you have extensive experience with this too, particularly in the GI psych clinic as well. Um, what are, what are a strat what's a strategy for, for a patient to, to, to either air those grievances or concerns and to maybe strengthen that relationship besides just dumping and avoiding that provider or looking for someone else? Is, is that beyond rescue? No, I think that's a, excellent to bring out overtly and especially I appreciate that you as an MD are um, acknowledging of this experience. Um, so uh, physicians have tremendous power in, in our culture um, and, and rightly so. They have tremendous expertise uh, and, and uh, generally tremendous intention to be of support, but sometimes that may not land as intended. Um, they're also under extraordinary time pressure. Um, and um, that's not your responsibility to think about, but in case that helps lessen the sting a little bit, uh, to be aware that's not, I don't think usually personally intended to be insensitive or 
less engaged than, than desired. These are also very complex conditions and it's hard to get at everything, especially in limited time. So I think it's helpful on, on a practical level to write down your questions, have your thoughts as organized as you can. And I like the suggestion Aaron was reiterating to have someone go with you. It's also helpful, you know, just by power of numbers, right? If you have a social support team um, that helps the physician um, kind of pause and, and um, they should take you seriously regardless, but I think it kind of emphasizes how important this is and um, help, helps them tune in to listen. That social support person can, you know, help kind of uh, make sure your questions get asked and answered. But to handle from a process standpoint, handle that directly, I think as Dr. Lambert was calling out the, the, the challenges very directly and, and um, um, unemotionally, that's a fantastic framework for describing your feelings to your provider. You might just pause and say, you know, this is my, <laughs> this is my perception. Um, I am not uh, feeling connected here. I don't feel like you're listening. Uh, if it's said in a direct and especially in a less emotional way, usually that can be heard and respected, I think received very well. Um, usually again, that intention is there, but if you call their attention to the, um, the missed opportunity or the gap, whether it's an understanding or empathy or connection, um, I, I think most of the time my experience in coaching patients through this is that they get attended to. And if it's still a mess, at least you know you've given it an opportunity to be addressed and you may want to um, advocate for yourself through the patient advocacy network or look for another provider. But at least giving an opportunity for that to be discussed uh, directly, um, I, I know very few physicians who would not welcome that. Yeah, that's 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 great input. It's. Uh... It's a little demoralizing on, on my side as, as I, uh, we, we really work hard, at least in my clinic, but I also will hear that even in my own clinic, uh, again, misperceived signals or allied health staff may, may contribute to some of that stress and pressure. Um, you know, one of the things I, when I see a patient from out of state or as a second or third line referral, um, I ask for the cheat codes. I, I wonder why, why are they looking for someone different? And, and honestly, a majority of the time is because of provider relationship. Mm -hmm. So it does take a lot of time and energy. And I'm not, I'll say that I am not the best. Um, I still struggle with this, but I think even just increasing awareness is probably important. But I think patients can do that for their providers. And again, that's one of the most common complaints I hear. Uh, maybe just maybe one question before we, we head to break. Anything that anybody would like to bring up with Dr. Montero? wait just a few more seconds here. Unless there's an immediate question, if I may take the opportunity to say, I, um, how do I express this in a few moments? Um, what, I am just so deeply honored to come alongside patients and I recognize your experience can be profoundly difficult. And that's really hard to put into words, right? And very individualized. And so I, I would just add, um, our intention is, if I can speak for the team, psychological and medical, our intention is to be present to you in whatever way we can. And um, I, I stand ready to um, be glad to connect with any of you individually. I've got my um, direct phone number in the presentation. And I think any um, engagement with mental health support, I always view as a proactive, smart thing to do. So to help to kind of debunk stigma further, nobody thinks anyone is crazy or the things are all in their head. There's no such thing as all in your head, by the way. There's no magical dividing line at the neck. <laughs> it doesn't exist. So I would welcome you and I know any of my colleagues would too. So thank you so much for having me today. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Montero. Again, we really appreciate it. it